Assalamu alaikum everyone uh, and welcome back to a introduction to English literature. It's been a long time since the last lecture, right? Uh, a week uh, or something. Uh, and I guess you missed me. Uh, I don't know if you missed me or not. I missed the, the lectures, but I missed the lectures. So I stopped this week. Uh, yani I'm posting only one lecture this week uh, because, you know, you have uh, midterm and everything. But uh, and I leave the, the discussion open for not one week, for two weeks. So uh, if you don't want to watch this lecture and take notes now, if you want to watch it after the midterms, it's up to you. This is one. Number two, uh, I'll talk more about the midterm. I already uh, told you everything, but um, uh, if you want any questions, I'll uh, give you more details in the comments section on the midterms uh, post okay uh, now let's move to our uh, um, to, our to our lesson today to our lecture the augustan age so now um, uh, we are not completely done with the restoration era uh, because we will talk about some figures today uh, from back then but now we are done with the old uh, or or, or um, uh, the the traditional forms of literature. Now we will learn a novel form, you know, novel form, a new form, which is called the novel. So it's called the new. Novel means a new. So this form is a new, and even its name is um, is is new. The novel. You know the novel. Everyone knows the novel. Uh, I've already recommended some novels for you to read. You know, a novel is a, a fiction um, uh, prose, not verse, prose, okay? And it's it's a kind of long um, text, uh, unlike the short story, short text, with short plots, short, uh, a small number of, of characters. Here we have a longer text, um, uh, probably... Uh, uh, so many characters uh, and the most important thing is that it's prose so for the first time we have uh, major prose texts the novel we'll talk uh, today about the context uh, of, of the novel uh, and we will discuss some novelists but before we start uh, let me ask you this question just remember with me, try to think, how many women authors have we studied so far from this course? From the Old English Literature, Middle English Literature, and uh, the Renaissance Era, the, um, uh, all, all the, the, uh, the ages and the eras that we studied. How many women authors, you know, poets or dramatists or whatever? Try to think, try to remember, how many? Zero. No woman. Why didn't women write? Didn't women um, write at that time? Or what's the reason? Try to think about this because definitely they wrote uh, texts. Definitely they wrote literature. But why didn't we study them? Why didn't their texts reach to us, arrive us to study them? Try to think about this. And today we will even uh, talk more about this. Why women were ignored? you know, kicked out of, of the canon and uh, of the literary ministry. Now, again, today we'll talk about the context. Then we'll discuss some novelists, two women for the first time, Afrobin and uh, Manly. Then we will end with Daniel Defoe and the famous uh, Robinson Crusoe. Okay? So, first, again, uh, England still... Uh, on the same status the monarchy is weak you know there's a king there's a queen there is everything but they don't have much power most of the power uh, is for the parliament and the prime minister you know so now the head of the country is not the king it's the prime minister remember back uh, during the, uh, the, the the era of king henry the eighth we have god then the king but now even the prime minister, even the members of the parliament are more important than the king. So uh, the monarchy 
was not as popular and was not as powerful as it used to be. Okay? And because of this, because, you know, the English people were uh, always, you know, connected to the king, to the queen, to the monarch, two failed uh, rebellions uh, happened. So two times people tried to rebel, you know, a revolution, a rebellion, two times, but it failed. They, both times failed. And at the same time, in the whole Europe and also in England, it was the time of the Industrial Revolution and the Agricultural Revolution. You know the Industrial Revolution, Tawra Sana'iya? And this caused, because you know, it's industrial, uh, so many industries, so many inventions, new inventions, uh, which made everything easier. You know, Industrial Revolution made everything in the world easier because we have so many tools, we have so many inventions that makes everything easier. Uh, in, in life. So everything that we used to do and takes time and effort, now we have some tool or some invention that uh, can save the time and the effort, you know, technology. And because, you know, England uh, had so many inventions and occupied so many places in the world, so this, uh, uh, the, 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 the empire, the, the colonies, with the market for the British products. So they produce things in England and then they market them elsewhere in the colonies, the places that they occupied. You know, again, we're talking about colonialism and imperialism. Okay. Also, one important feature of, of this era, we'll talk more about the features in the next lecture, uh, but one of the most important features, uh, very important for the context, is that people, one, moved from the country, you know, the countryside, the reef, to, to the new cities. So people moved from the country to the city. This is one. Two, a new um, class has emerged, uh, the middle class. Now we have the middle class in England. We'll talk more about this um, later. But uh, let's come back to, uh, to the context now. Two failed rebellions, but still, you know, failed. They failed. They did not succeed. And in a way, England stayed calm. Compared to comparing, uh, comparing it to Europe, to the, to the rest of the world, the Western world, Europe, no, England was really strong and stable. You know, uh, there is no much um, chaos in England. Because uh, one of the colonies, however, uh, one of the colonies, uh, the British colonies is America. America before was a British colony, you know. The British they occupied uh, the, the new continent, uh, America. But then in 1767, uh, the, the, America, the, the people, the immigrants, uh, the European people uh, who occupied America um, declared their independence from Britain. So when they lost one colony, one important colony, the, the uh, the immigrants, people who created the American society, uh, declared their independence, you know, in 1776. This is uh, in America. So if two steps away from England, just, just right there beside England, we have France, you know. Uh, France is, is very near, very close to England. Uh, and um, what happened in France, a very major event. Uh, in the history of, of Europe and maybe in the history of the world, the French Revolution in 1789. Maybe you studied um, uh, the French Revolution in, in the history uh, uh, in history in school, and you know how important the, the French Revolution, 1789. So you know the English people had all these things in mind. Uh, everywhere there are revolutions, but it's in, inside England, people had learned the lesson. Uh, when they executed the king and they had civil war, then they learned the lesson. Uh, we had um, a peaceful, bloodless revolution, the glorious revolution, and then we had two failed revolution. So they were convinced that they don't want violence, no, they don't want blood, unlike what happened in America and in, in France. Uh, and the French Revolution was very important because, yes, it was a revolution that... Um, uh, removed the, the system, the regime, but also the, the values of the revolution, uh, the spirit of liberty, equality, and fraternity 
they uh, spread all over Europe and including England. You know, liberty, liberty, freedom, liberty, equality from equal to be equal and uh, fraternity, you know, brotherness, you know, to khuwa. So these values spread all over Europe and affected uh, England as well. Okay? And because of all these things that were happening all, all over uh, Europe and the Western society, the Western world, um, uh, all of these things sent a signal uh, to, to, to England, to, to Britain. Maybe you are next. Maybe you are next. Maybe uh, a, a civil war will happen again. And people didn't want because, again, they had learned a lesson. Okay? And among all of this chaos, chaos among all of these uh, events that happened, uh, the literature uh, became more important. Yes, drama, you know, because after the, the theater was closed and then it was reopened, but it was less important now. Because, you know, it was closed in its heyday, in the time of Shakespeare, Marlowe. Shakespeare was like, uh, has just died, like, uh, I don't know how many, a few years ago, and then they closed the, the, the theater. So even when they re reopened the theater, it was less important. But the novel became more and more important. Why? Now, the novel didn't start in the Augustan age. It started um, a little bit before the Augustan age, but it became more important in the Augustan age. We'll talk about when did it start and why it was ignored back then. Uh, but now let's focus on the, re the reasons it, it, gained, uh, it gained more importance. One, more people could read and write. You know, people started to go to school and even kids started to go to school and there were novels, uh, we'll talk about this next time, novels especially and only for kids, you know, children literature. This is one. Two, writing became a profession. What does that mean? Writers now gain money from their writing. They would sell uh, the, the texts they, uh, they write, which means that they no longer want a patron. They no longer want the patron. Remember the patron? Now, a poet or a dramatist would write, especially the poets would write poetry, and then the patron would, pay, would, would give them money and they praise him or something, and then the, the patron gives them protection. But now, no. It's a profession. Now, it's a job. They, it's, it's a paid job, uh, writing. But why? How did it become a profession? Because of journalism. You know, journalism from journal, a sahafa, from sahifa journal. Uh, now, we have journals and magazines in Europe, okay? And uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the owners of these journals uh, would come to the writers and tell them, okay, I want you to write me a novel, and I will publish this novel in, in the journal, uh, in, in the magazine, you know? One chapter each week, and I'll pay you uh, uh, for this novel. So now writers write and publish their novels in, in the magazines and in the journals and the newspapers, and they will uh, gain money uh, from them. Which means that writers would write more because, you know, the more you write, the more money you get. Uh, and they don't now have to, to, um, to amuse uh, the patron. Instead, now, they would write something that would amuse the audience, the people who would, who would read uh, uh, their magazines, and they want to amuse uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the publishers, the people who would publish their, uh, their texts, you know? Uh, so everything has changed now. And this, Afikra, um, this has caused so many um, problems sometimes because a writer would kill a character, you know, would kill a character off in, in the text. And people, the audience would be angry at this writer. Uh, so they make him bring this character back in the next chapter. You know, people would start, you know, burning the, uh, the newspapers when they find that their favorite character is dead. So even the writer sometimes doesn't have uh, enough power over, over the text that he's writing over uh, or she's writing over the novel. Okay, Okay. the last reason uh, from these reasons, and one of the most important ones, again, the, um, the, the economic power of the middle class. Now, back uh, in, in the 
medieval ages, we only had two classes, you know, the upper class and the lower class. The lower class are people who are not, who don't have time because they work all the time, they are very poor and everything. And the upper class are, you know, the nobles, the, um, uh, the kings, the queens, the princes, and, and these people. But now we have the middle class, people who are not, you know, very rich, they are not very uh, uh, important, but still they are, um, you know, they have money because they work in, in some professions here and there, you know, lawyers, uh, accountants, doctors, engineers, not, not engineers, but, you know, uh, these profession teachers uh, and these professions, and they would gain money from these professions uh, and they have time. Not very rich, not very poor, in the middle, middle classes. And these people, because they have money and they have time, they would read um, uh, uh, novel. Okay? Now let's start with Afrapen. Who is Afrapen? Afrapen, uh, now she's not from the Augustan age. Okay? She's back from the Restoration age. You know, the age of satire and uh, the, the important people uh, uh, back then. She was from that age, but she was ignored. Now, always women have written fiction because, you know, people write fiction, uh, especially women, you know, they would write to express uh, themselves, to, to, to tell their stories and uh, to, to tell their emotions. But they were always ignored, you know, because all the critics, all the publishers, they are men and they... Most of them were anti-feminist, thinking that women uh, should not write. Women are less smart than men, uh, less intellectual, less creative, and they should not write. And this is why they were ignored and kicked out. You know, you should uh, stay in the kitchen barefoot and pregnant. This is what you should do. Other than this, no. But in the late 17th century and early 18th century, uh, women... Um, uh, uh, were the greatest part of the readership. What does this mean? Uh, most of the readers are women now because, you know, women uh, had more time, more, more free time, so uh, they were, and, you know, more free time and they don't have things to do uh, because, you know, the society limits them. So now they, they have uh, literature. They can read. They can uh, spend their time reading. And because they didn't have a lot to do with the world going there and there, because the society, again, limits them, literature gives them this chance to understand the world and to see the world from different perspectives. Because, yes, she had to stay at home. At least when she's at home, she reads the book, and the book, uh, the novel, would, um, uh, would get her out uh, of, 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 the, of her room, uh, of her house. Okay? Now, Afra Ben wrote this very important text, Love Letters uh, Between a Nobleman and His Sister. This is the first uh, English novel ever. So she's actually the mother of, uh, remember we said about Chaucer, he was, he's, he was the father of English uh, literature. This was, he's the father of, of poetry, father of drama, the father of Kaza and Kaza. She was the mother of English uh, novel, but no one, um, uh, gave her uh, gave her this title back then. They, they ignored her. Now, love letters between a nobleman and his sister, uh, or or you can uh, remember it as love letters by Afra Ben. This is an epistolary novel. What does it mean? It's a novel uh, that depends mainly on exchanging letters. You know, uh, a nobleman and his sister they exchange letters. Letters. She sends him a letter, and he sends her uh, a letter back. And this is the whole novel. You read the events by reading the letters uh, between them. So many people still use this um, technique right now. The epistolary novel, you know, uh, from letters, uh, depending on letters, okay? When she wrote this novel using this technique, nobody cared, nobody read her, they ignored her. But 60 years later, this uh, technique, this type of novels, the epistolary novels, became important 60 years later. Why? Because men started to write using this technique. So when men copied her, when men imitated her, this uh, technique became important. People recognized it. This tells how anti-feminist societies uh, were at that time. 
okay? And everything because all of these problems, uh, all of this um, uh, uh, ignoring to, to women uh, due to the critics who were all men. All of them were men, male, male critics. You know the critics in Nuqad? All of them. Uh, another text by here is Orunoko. You know, Orunoko, it's, it's not even an English word, okay? And this is the first philosophical novel in English, a philosophical novel, okay? Uh, who's uh, Orunoko? You know, it's clearly not English. Uh, this is an African prince, you know, this is an African prince who was enslaved, you know, they, um, uh, they captured them uh, uh, in, in, in Africa, okay, and they enslaved them. So he was a prince, uh, you know, uh, a prince in his people, in his country, and now he's a slave in, in England, okay. And you know how sad, how tragic this is to be a slave and then uh, to be a prince and then a slave. But still, the novel is not only about, you know, princes and, you know, the important people, but also about everyone, the slaves, the, the, the poor people here and there. And this uh, novel is for the first time, maybe, uh, this novel protests against uh, trade of slaves. Uh, she's criticizing society. Not only uh, she's talking about women and the rights of women, but also uh, she's criticizing slaves and she's criticizing colonialism. So we have the first woman here to, uh, to read about and she's the best uh, author so far, okay? So she discussed women's rights. She discussed, uh, she was against the, trades, uh, the trade of slaves, you know, Tijarat al-Abid and colonialism. And she was not afraid of society. She wrote everything uh, she believed in in a strong manner um, and uh, defended uh, women's rights, defended, uh, you know, slaves and the, colo uh, the colonized people. And this is why, one of the reasons, she was a woman, this one, one reason, but uh, two, because of this, because of the problems that she was, she discussed, she was an outsider, you know, they kicked her out of the canon. This is Alpha Ben, okay? And this is why, you know, Virginia Woolf, we, we talked about her uh, before, and we will talk about her more. Uh, she's a 20th century critic. What did she say? She said that all women together ought to let flowers fall upon the tomb, uh, the, the, the tomb of Afra Pen, for it was she who earned them the right to speak their minds. She's saying that all the women should put flowers on the grave of Afra Pen, of Afra Pen, because uh, she's the one, uh, the first one to give them the right to speak their minds, to tell what they think of. She was very strong, this Afra Pen. Uh, and very famous, but still she was ignored. And maybe this is why she criticized society because you know, society ignored her, society uh, uh, was against women and against slaves and against people from the colonies. And uh, so she was not only, uh, and this is very important, Yajma, we Palestinians are against the Israeli occupation, right? Because it's unfair, it's wrong. And this is why we should also be against, we should also, uh, 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 fight all the um, injustices uh, 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 around us, you know, we're against uh, the Zionism, we should be against patriarchy, we should be also uh, uh, against uh, colonialism uh, elsewhere here and there, we should uh, ag be against dictatorships here and there, not only the Israelites, because we know, we know how unfair it is, we know how, uh, how, how, how bad it is, and this is why we should be uh, also against all the unfair causes here, all the fair causes, all the injustices here and there around the world, okay? So this is uh, what Virginia Woolf said uh, on Afra Ben. This is how important Afra Ben is. Even though she was ignored at her time, but now we can know, we can tell how important uh, this Afra Ben is. Uh, then we have uh, another woman. Her name is Mary Du. Uh, La Revue Manly, Mary uh, Manly, okay? You can remember her as Mary Manly, okay? Uh, very long name. Now, Mary, she was a satirist, again, a satirist, you know? She wrote satire, just like Dryden uh, and, and, and the guys from uh, the Restoration Era. And again, she's, um, uh, 
she wrote uh, a very sharp, very sharp and personal uh, satire. You know, personal, she was attacking people, sometimes mentioning their name and sometimes not mentioning their name, but still attacking them. Very witty, very sharp. Dryden was the best critic ever there, the best poet, the best satirist, but he, but manly, even though she was good, uh, just like him and maybe better, she was considered scandalous, you know, scandalous from scandal, scandalous fadayhiyya, you know, from scandal, fadiha. She was considered scandalous and she was ignored by the critics, uh, this uh, Mary Manley. See how crazy um, uh, people, uh, people were against women, you know, very clearly anti-feminist. Uh, you know, the double standards, uh, when a man does it, it's good, it's okay, it's clever, it's, it's, uh, we like it. But when a woman uh, does the same thing, they don't like it. Uh, when, a woman does, uh, when a woman does something very important, they will ignore it. When the man just uh, uh, does the same, now he gets all the praise. And this is how the double standards of, of this society uh, back then. Now, this book, The Secret History of Queen uh, Zarab in 1705, one of her books, but most importantly, we, we have the new uh, the new Atlantis, you know, the Atlantis, the new Atlantis. This was a political book and it discussed a very, very important themes such as rape, you know, a woman discussing rape for the first time. Men ignored the, the, this issue, you know, rape, you know, uh, men ignored this, the, the, the male authors uh, ignored rape, for example. But Manly, because she's a woman, she's the victim of the, this is why the, vic the victims should write, Yajma'a. This is why we Palestinians are the ones who should write about our conflict and our, about our cause. Uh, because we know more, okay? Because no one will write about the Zanana. We, only us, only we can, uh, can write about it because we know uh, uh, how, how um, uh, torturing uh, it is. And this is why she discussed uh, uh, for example, rape, this, this, uh, defending a woman's right again, uh, rights again, okay? Uh, however, when she discussed this issue and other issues, they again considered her scandalous, you know? Because how come you, how come uh, can you discuss something as sensitive as this? You, you can't write this. But other uh, authors, the men, they can write whatever they want. They can describe women physically and uh, say whatever they want to say, it's okay. But a woman does it, okay, it's ayeb now, it's haram. Only because it's a woman uh, who writes about these things. And again, we can spend hours talking about how um, they divided and how they discriminated against uh, women. Okay, and still for this very day, uh, societies and people all around the world uh, still discriminate against women. And this is why we still have uh, the feminist movement, feminism. Okay, uh, so Ben and Manley were the mothers of the English novel, but uh, they were ignored. And we will see how now with Daniel Defoe, they called him the father of the English novel, even though he wrote uh, so many years after him. And they considered Man, uh, Mary Manley scandalous. But was she scandalous? If, if in the exam I asked you true or false, Mary Manley was scandalous. True or false? It's false. It's wrong. She was not scandalous. But they framed her. They considered her this even though she was not. Okay? She was a very sharp, a very witty uh, author. Moving to Daniel Defoe now. Uh, this is a very important figure in the history of England, uh, of English literature, uh, Daniel Defoe, you know. I have his book, I, I, uh, I showed to you in, in, the, in the very first lecture, I guess, uh, and beca because this is the book that uh, people remember him for, Robinson Crusoe, for Daniel Defoe. This is a book, a very uh, good book, uh, and you can read it. It's not a very long one. How many pages? You have uh, less than 300 pages. So you can read this uh, book, very uh, amusing one, very interesting one, by Daniel Defoe. Now, first, he started his life as a journalist. And we will say how, uh, we will see how uh, this affected his, his style of writing. He started as a journalist. 
And then in 1719, he wrote Robinson Crusoe. Ijma, can you remember uh, when did Alfra Ben write uh, her books? Uh, in 16, in, 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 in the middle uh, 17th century, uh, she wrote her books. So more than, more than 50 years later, uh, we have Daniel Defoe publishing Robinson Crusoe. Not, no, more than 60 years later, not only 50, more than 60 years later, he uh, published Robinson Crusoe. And, and this is uh, the most successful work in the world and uh, the first English novel. There are so many novels before this. Now, but this is the first time a, a man writes a good novel. This is the first novel. And we will ignore all the other texts by women. Okay? But actually, truly, it's a very good novel. It's a very good novel. But we will see what's behind this, um, this good novel, in a way. Okay? Now, what does Crusoe uh, So it starts so many uh, events, but at the end, he reached uh, uh, an island. And he's alone in the island, okay? Nobody's there, and he makes uh, a kingdom in his island. And again, this is the Western European man. Wherever you go, you can be the king. You can uh, rule uh, uh, the world. So he makes a kingdom in this island after his ship is wrecked. So he's alone in the island. He can't go back. He, he makes a kingdom. And he remained there for 28 years. And he built a society. And then... He saved some. He, he found someone and saved him uh, from the cannibals, you know. Uh, and the whole society was he and uh, Cru uh, Crusoe, Robinson Crusoe, and this man and uh, a parrot, you know, a parrot, you know, al -Bagha, you know. So two men and one parrot. And this man is called Friday, you know, a very, in a way, funny name. Yes, we have Friday in Arabic. We call people Jumaa, but they don't do it in, in English. So we have Friday. His name is Friday. And he calls him always uh, my man. My man. You know? Even he owns him as if uh, he's a slave. And we have Polly. Who is Polly? Polly is a parrot. You know, a parrot. So uh, again, this is the Western civilization. Um, they think that other people who are not Europeans are uh, their own. They own, the, they own them, okay? Uh, this is one. They don't think of us as uh, human beings. No, we are objects. They can own us. And two, they want people who imitate them, who just echo them, copy them. They don't want people who say no and yet. No, they want parrots, uh, you know? People who just would repeat the, th the same uh, things their masters uh, would tell them. Um, now, now the, st the story uh, can be read as an allegory of survival because so many things happened in the story and uh, Crusoe always uh, survives uh, the difficulties he faces. So many things and he always survives. So it can be read as a, a, an allegory of, you know, fable, fable, um, you know, like a traditional story, you know. It could be re read and, uh, as an allegory of survival. And also as a praise of the white European spirit. Again, you know, the white European man who can go everywhere and survive and become the ruler and, you know, uh, rule the people, control everything. Um, and the, the, the text also starting from uh, the day Crusoe uh, was born, you know, the first thing uh, in the book. The first, first line. No, what is it? Okay, let me read you the first, the first line, the first. Okay, by then. Okay, the first line. I was born in the year sixteen thirty-two. So it starts from he he he's telling the story. I was born in the year sixteen thirty-two, and then he tells the whole story of his life, how he's born, his family. He discusses the values uh, of, of family, of religion. Uh, he discusses all these um, uh, values of, of the British and the European uh, societies uh, generally. Okay? Uh, so he grows rich in the, in the, in the, 
in the island after he's uh, there. And then some people come and uh, he can go back uh, to his place, to his original town. And uh, what does he become? The new capitalist. And then he, he brings more people and go back to the island, to his kingdom. You know, capitalist from capitalism, Ra's al-Mal, Ra's Maliyya, he becomes the new capitalist, Ra's Mali al-Jadid, you know. And again, this is uh, the Western uh, values. You know, capitalism is, is at the core of the Western uh, world. Uh, where property and white man's power are more important than, uh, you know, the important things. Only property, only the power uh, that matters. Love do does no longer matter. Relationships, marriage, they don't matter now. Or at least not as important as, uh, you know, property and power and uh, money. And this is why in the book, when he talks about marriage, he talks about everything, meeting her and marry, everything about the marriage in, in one in one page where he spends pages and chapters talking about uh, other things that are should should be less important than marriage no marriage it should be uh, something crucial in his life but no it takes only one page in in the whole uh, novel okay so he doesn't really care about um, about relationships and the human he, he only cares about profits and money and power gaining power you know uh, and then we also, uh, let's see how uh, the, the story ends in a happy uh, way. And this was uh, a general, um, uh, in a way, uh, something uh, popular back then. Uh, most of the novels uh, ended in, in a happy way uh, because, you know, it gives uh, hope for the future or uh, suggests that you know white people uh, white uh, us the Europeans the white people we can survive this is why it's uh, uh, it, ha it ends in, in a happy uh, in a happy way but uh, again the post-colonial critics remember Edward Said talking about the tempest this is similar very similar to the tempest he goes a white man goes to to an island and he is uh, there uh, the the ruler of this island so post-colonial critics consider this novel as an allegory of imperialism again again an allegory of imperialism this book is also an allegory of imperialism according to the post-colonial critics such as Edward Said okay and when because the native of, of the island, you know, Friday, the only person who is actually from this island is presented as the uncivilized and inferior uh, who needs to be saved, you know. The white man saves him and then he becomes his man, his man, okay, Friday. And he's uncivilized, unlike uh, Crusoe. But not only Friday, Jama. Even the parrot is more clever than Friday. Not, not only Crusoe, but only uh, also the parrot, Polly, is more clever uh, than Friday. You know, the language of Friday, he says man's instead of men, me so instead of I so, for example. So, you know, his grammar is, uh, and you know, when someone has a very weak grammar, uh, they consider uh, less smart, less civilized. However, Polly, the parrot, uses the past perfect tense. I don't know uh, how many times do I use this tense, the past perfect tense. It's not a very used um, uh, tense, you know. It, it needs someone who's good at language to use uh, the past perfect tense. But Polly the parrot uses it, while Friday commits uh, obvious mistakes and grammar. And this is why, again, they consider this an allegory of imperialism, because... Uh, it depicts the native people as inferior and civilized people, unlike the European, the white uh, people who are very civilized. And, uh, and, uh, now, because he was a um, Daniel Defoe, because he was a journalist uh, at the beginning, before he, start, he started being a novelist, um, his texts start in uh, or use the first person narrator. You know, the first person narrator, I, my. You know, it starts, I was born. 
okay? Unlike the third person narrator, you know, when you use he and she and it, he was born. But no, he uses the first person narrator. Uh, this is uh, this was his technique in, in most of his writing, okay? Uh, and he tells it from his point of view, from his point uh, of, of view, okay? Um, type. There's another novel uh, by Defoe, which is Moll Flanders, Moll Flanders, you know, a story of a woman. Now he's talking about a woman who has been a prostitute and a thief, you know, a prostitute and a thief, this one. But the story, again, using the first person narrator, I, okay? She tells the story when, when she has reformed, when she became a good person. She's no longer a prostitute, she's no longer a thief. Now she's telling the story uh, from her uh, point of view, from the first uh, person uh, nar narrator, when she has reformed and changed her life. You know, she became a better person, okay? And this is why the novel uh, gives a moral uh, lesson, a moral point about how, you, how people should live their lives and how it ends in, in a happy way, uh, which gives people again hope and uh, tell them uh, the way of living. But also, uh, going back to our first lecture, when we talked about literature and how important literature is. Okay? Now, not so many people can uh, get the chance to try to be thieves and prostitutes, right? You know, because you don't want to be. But you want to know how it feels, you know. You, you want to know um, how it could become. And reading literature is a way to live this experience and to see this terrible experience uh, which is enough for you to not uh, experience it yourself. You know, you read it and you feel sorry for her and uh, you know that you should not do it. Okay? Uh, and again, just like Robinson Crusoe, Moll Flanders uh, uh, discusses the concerns of, uh, of, of the people of that age, uh, talking about sensitive uh, issues that people are interested in. Uh, and this was a very um, famous uh, or very popular technique uh, back then. People would take uh, the bad side of life, they would talk about everything bad, and then they would end uh, happily uh, at the end. To, 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 to tell uh, the readers that yes, life is horrible, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's worth living. It's worth uh, living, it's, it's worth the, tr uh, the trouble. Uh, and this technique, uh, this plot continued for a longer time, you know, even during the Victorian era. Um, and can we think uh, about the reason? Why did uh, he choose a woman as the main character in his novel? Because again, the author now should please uh, the publishers and the readers. And most of the readers are women, and that, this is why he is bringing one of them to be the main character, a woman, to please the readership. Most of them were uh, women, okay? Uh, that's it for today. I, I hope you enjoyed uh, today's lecture uh, for discussion. And again, I leave this for two, for two weeks, not uh, for any... You know, um, for the week of the midterms and then another week after the midterms, okay? Uh, discussion, critics ignored Ben and Manley, considering Defoe to be the father of the English novel. Why? Why do you think they ignored them? Can you think uh, of, of the reasons? Can you tell me your opinion about this in, in the discussion? Okay, uh, that's it for today and see you inshallah after the midterms. I hope the exam would be very easy and uh, it will be very easy for you if you studied uh, well and if you studied hard, okay? Uh, see you soon, inshallah, in the next uh, lectures. We continue with the novel, part two, uh, the, English, uh, the English novel, The Augustan Age. Assalamu